Good afternoon. Welcome to Crosspoint Apostolic Center. My name is Nick. I am glad to welcome you guys here today. Uh, welcome all our guests online watching today. Um, we are so glad that you are joining us. Uh, just a few quick announcements before we get started with today's service. I'd like to welcome you guys here today. Tuesday uh, at 7 p.m. We are going to continue our Bible studies. And Thursdays we will be going to continue our Gospel Nights as we continue to go over the book of Matthew chapter 4. Fridays 7 p.m. Join us at Java Jay's Coffee House for worship night. Tell a friend, be there. You don't want to miss what God is doing in Orlando. We all want you to be a part of this. And our services will continue here Saturdays. And we will continue to do fellowship hour at 12 o'clock till 1 o'clock. Uh, we will have plenty of food and uh, refreshments for you, so please come and join us for that. And um, Right now, I'm just going to open up in a quick prayer. Uh, before we get started. So Heavenly Father, just thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for allowing us to gather in your house, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can go after you today and serve you unconditionally, Father. Thank you that uh, you are just here with us, Father. I pray, Lord, that as Pastor Rob comes and brings a message, Lord, that this word is of you and for you, Father. I pray that it will bring joy to you. I pray that it will glorify you, Father. I pray that those hearing the word today will receive from you, Father. I pray that you just prepare their hearts and their ears for you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. No, I think you guys have joined us today. We're continuing on our series of Order of Salvation. This is part of this is part two. Last week we covered the doctrine of predestination. We talked about God's knowledge of all things of all things before the foundation of the world. Today we're continuing on that to where then we're going to talk about election. Predestination and election. They usually go hand in hand, but in this instance we isolated them so that we can give more coverage to what predestination is versus what is election. So when we talk about election, Election is similar to God's knowledge of all things pertaining to our salvation, but election deals with God choosing God choosing us onto salvation. Right? So to begin, the doctrine of election is a doctrine that focuses on the saved who are called the elect, thus the word election. There's two views of election. The first view is individual election. The second view is corporate election. So there's two camps on, on election. Right? So you have the individual election, that's usually the Calvinist camp, and then you have corporate election, that's usually the Arminius camp. So we covered those, we covered those two, two doctrines in last week's sermon. So to go a little bit more deeper in, in what is the difference between the two views of election, individual election is a view that God picks certain people whom will be saved. This is called casual determinism. So God, so God moves you, God moves you onto salvation, so he determined for you to be saved, but he directs you onto salvation. Then there's a corporate view of election, which is the view that Christ is the elect, and all who put their faith in him are the elect. This is just basic foreknowledge. With this view, this is what the Armenians hold to, that Christ was the elect, and God foreknew who would accept, who accepted plea for salvation and would choose Christ. So they are at, so they are added in because Christ is the elect one. This the point of contention is with this one verse, Ephesians 1 4, where it says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. This is the core of the debate between the Calvinist and the Arminius. And and this is because that God's selection, this verse is showing, is before the foundations of the world. So saying God selected who will be saved before the foundation of the world, is said he chose us in him before the foundation, before the foundation of the world. So how that is interpreted, you have some that say that this is individualistic, that this is saying that God selected individual people unto salvation before the foundation of the world, whereas the other camp is saying God knew who would choose to be in him before the foundations of the world. Before we, before we can determine which view is most consistent with the scripture, we have to look at what the scripture talks about in regards to election in other places. Starting with the first people whom God elected. And that is with the election of Israel, the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was elected through one person. 
Now, one person with Abraham. So the first person we'll look at is the election of Abraham. So starting in Joshua 24, 2, it says, Then Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Why are we starting off with this? Because this is talking about before the call of Abraham. So when people think of the election of Abraham, they think of the call of Abraham, where God selected and elected Abraham to be the one to where the promise was given, the covenant was given, and the promise would come through, that promise being Christ. Right? But we're looking at the conditions before that call. And what was the condition before Abraham was called? Then called Abram. He was an idol worshiper, according to this scripture. He was an idol worshiper before the Lord called on to him. So he wasn't a believer in the true God. He was a worshiper of idols. You see this, you see this in Acts 7 2, where he said that he said, Brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Herod. In Mesopotamia, they worshipped, they worshipped a plurality of gods, they were polytheistic, they worshipped idols, and God revealed himself to Abraham when he was in his idolatrous ways. You see in Joshua 24, 3, that I took your father Abram, Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants, and gave him Isaac. So when he, so when he, when he elected Abraham, before he elected Abraham, Abraham was not pursuing him. Abraham was not pursuing him. Abraham was not looking towards God. He was worshiping idols when the God of the Lord revealed himself to him. So, there had, so when it comes down to the election of Abraham, it was first a revelation of the person of God before, before he came and followed him. Right? And then when he followed him, it says that he led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. Right? So when it, is, when it says, I took your father Abraham, the Hebrew word for took is lakah, which means to take seas or to take by the hand. This points Abraham's election by God to be solely based off of God's decision. How can we say that there was a free will, there was a libertarian free will, complete free will, when the word used, I took your father Abraham, was I took him by hand. I took him by hand and I died in him. Right? Abram's election was for what purpose, though? It was to bring about the nation of Israel. So there was an elect calling of one person that was then to bring about the national state of Israel. As we see in Genesis 12, too, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And then in Deuteronomy 14, too, it says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So the first thing when you look at election, the election of Israel, the nation, it was so that they could be a holy people. All right? So God's selection of Israel makes them holy, pointing to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So the call, so the call, the call on the salvation is to make us holy. And we are made holy through the Holy Spirit indwelling in us because God is holy. So if God resides in us, we are made holy through his work. But then it, and then it says, the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself. This points to a particular redemption that is only for the elect. And he says that he has chosen them for himself. He didn't choose all the nations. And it wasn't that he reached out to the nations and they rejected you don't see that in the scripture. You see God being very particular with one race of people, and that race was Israel. He was not particular with the other pagans that were around him. He was particular with Israel. Now, before now before we get get a get a fully our now mindset, the Israelites prior to God revealing Himself to their father, being Abram, he wasn't a worshiper of God. He was a pagan. He was a pagan. So Abram wasn't any different than the Canaanites or the other people that were in the surrounding lands. He was just as pagan as they were. The only difference is God revealed himself to him. So that points to a particular redemption. And then it says a special treasure above all the peoples. So Israel was chosen to be a special treasure above all the peoples. So the purpose of election is to be used by God. To be used by God as a special treasure to show that you are my special possession. That I am God over the land of Israel. He wasn't God over any other, over every other land. He was God. He was God particularly to Israel. So he was God particularly.
it to one group of people. What is this? This points to the church. This points to the church because God is God to us. He is God over all creation, yes. But he has a special love to those who believe in him. These are the elect, those who have faith. Right? Now, there, now there's still some people who may contend for election being based on the premise of foreknowledge. You see, in, in Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, there it says, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. So anybody who still holds to this belief that election, salvation is based off of God for knowing your free will decision, the scripture itself goes against that. Where it says the Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number. For you were the least of all peoples. So it wasn't that that Israel was given given a chance to respond and they and they were faithful in their response and that's why they were chosen. It says that he was they were chosen because they were the least of all people. God personally selected Israel because they were the least of all people. Why? Because that is what demonstrates his glory. That is what demonstrates his supremacy. Choosing the smallest of all people, the meekest of all people, is the greatest way to show his power. For if he chose a mighty nation to, to be used by him, then, he, then you can say it is because they were mighty that they were chosen by God. It's because they were smart, and that's why, and that's why they choose God. That's why God chose them. But in this instance, if you are a small nation, then on what merit can you say that you're used by God? And the people who advocate for God choosing people on your free will response, that gives that implication that I was chosen because I was smart enough. I was chosen because, because I was wise enough. I was chosen because I was good enough. That limits the supremacy of God and that minimizes his glory and his power to bring us onto himself. There was a personal selection. There was a personal selection onto salvation. In the, in the heart of God, in the mind of God, right? So to further, to, to further debunk this myth that, that our free will decisions in the libertarian sense, like I can accept Christ or I can reject Christ, we go on to, to see what support do they use, the advocates of free will. They use support of the election of Christ. Christ was the elect. And they use passages like Isaiah 42, 1, where it says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Advocates of complete free will in response to God's plea of salvation. Take this back. He says, my elect one. With my elect one. My elect one speaks of Christ. All right, my servant and elect one is speaking of Christ is in whom my soul delights. So I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. This talks about, this is talking about Jesus coming in the form of man, God becoming flesh to bring forth justice to the Gentiles. What is that talking about? It's talking about the Gentiles coming into covenantal relationship with God. Christ is posited as this elect one in this, in, in this view of free will in the libertarian sense. Whereas in the corporate view, we go back to Ephesians 1 4, it just says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without. Blame before him in love. The focus, the, the focus for those who reject the corporate view of election, which a corporate view of election, if each one form makes the most sense with the corporate view that you are cho you are chosen, you are chosen by God, and is not chosen in response to God for knowing your free will decisions, because it says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So before the foundation of the world, before we were even born, before we were even conceived, God already determined whom he would save, right? But people who don't believe in this, they focus on the part where it says, in him. They correlate the in him to be in Christ. So they interpret this, we are chosen in him based off of our decision to say yes to him. But that's adding to the scripture of Ephesians 1.4. Right? They correlate Christ as elect, suggesting our election is based off of our enjoining with Christ through faith. Which, yes, we are enjoined to Christ through faith, but we are not elected unto salvation based off of, based off of God's foreknowledge of whether we're going to say yes or no. We're elected on the premise, on the premise of God's desire to save us. Right? Both views of election and faith is necessary for joining in him. 
But before the foundation of the world, suggested in the corporate view to reflect God's foreknowledge in the, in the free will, in the free will camp, right? But in the compatibilist camp, which is a reconciliation between man's free will and God's divine providence, speaking of God's provision, a more of a call and determination standpoint, it makes more logical sense to, to interpret this as a particular salvation, as a particular Redemption as an individual, as an individual call to salvation that Christ chose you particularly, right? People who still advocate for free will, for free, for free will, completely, they then have to answer this: Why do some say yes to Christ and some say no? There's only two reasonable objections. One, the premise of free will, which is what they start off in their contention. The second is what's called open theism. Open theism meaning meaning that God does not know of the future, right? So to, to to look to examine is free is free will the reason why we say yes or no? Let's look at John three nineteen through twenty one, where it says, "And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth." comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So the first premise that you can take from this passage to suppose free will is where it says men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil, and then where it says but he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen. This posits man's exercise of choice is based off of the desires of their heart, whether good or evil. So I have to get the free will because they see this is evidence of free will. But the premise is based off of what? The desires of your heart. All right? So what is the desires of the heart according to the scripture? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So what does this mean? Deceitful in Hebrew is a cause, which means polluted. Desperately wicked is a nas, which means incurable. The heart is therefore, is therefore incurably polluted. This, our, heart, our heart is incurably polluted by sin. This then goes into the nature of man, which is talking about the sin nature that is present in all men. Right? So that what, to what extent does, does the sin, does sin corrupt and pollute us? The, the, the scripture shows overwhelming evidence that we are totally depraved. But what is total depravity? Total depravity is the doctrine that man is totally corrupt, just as Jeremiah 17, 9 says, and therefore totally unable to do anything spiritually good. What that means is you are incapable of responding to God unless he first moves in your heart. Well, where is the evidence for this? In Romans 3, 10 through 12, it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. This is overwhelming. He said there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. This is talking about the whole scope. The whole scope of man. People who don't, people who reject this premise, they use an argument, argument that this is a quotation from, from the Psalms, in Psalm 14, 1 through 3, where it says, A fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. People who, do, who challenge the view of total depravity, they take this passage and they say the context of this passage is speaking of the corrupt leaders, as it says in verse 4. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on the Lord? Right? It says, who eat up my people as they eat bread. This speaks of corrupt leaders who ministered in the temple. Because those that ministered in the temple, they were worthy of bread. They had the right to get bread and meat. Right? So saying that he eats up their people as they eat bread and do not call on the Lord. So these are counterfeit leaders. These are false teachers that were present in the temple. Many, many then take this because they take this context and say this can't apply to all people. This just has to apply to the people that, that are wicked. 
So then this causes some people to abandon the view of depravity of man, and they suppose man is born initially good, and later corrupted by sin, or left with a residue of good. This view is known as Pelagianism, and it's a doctrine that espouses we are born inherently good, and it's heresy. There's another view that's similar to this, that's called partial depravity, which a lot of Arminians do hold to. And it's also known as semi-Pelagianism, and it's a doctrine that man has preserved a sense of goodness, and that sin only partially corrupted man in his desires, but not his will to choose good. The problem in, in, with this is if you look at the context of Romans, of Romans 3, starting in verse 9, it says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. He's saying all are under sin, Jew and Gentile alike. This isn't talking about a select group of people. This is talking about the whole sum of creation. That we are all under sin. And what does it mean to be under sin? Under in Greek is hypo, which in other passages in Romans is used to reflect dominion. So it's saying that we're all under dominion of sin. Every last one of us prior to hearing the gospel and prior to regeneration, we are all under the dominion of sin. Our sinful nature has so entrapped us and so perverted our nature and so corrupted us and so polluted us that there is no way that we could go to God on our own without the Holy Spirit first moving in our hearts. We see this evidence in Ephesians 2, 3, where it says, Among whom also we all conducted ourselves in the loss of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So anybody who says that there's any good in our nature, well, then you have to say there's good in Satan. Because it says that we are children of wrath by what? By nature. Not by choice, but by nature. Just as the others. So Paul is saying to the believers, you once had the nature of the devil, just as those who have not yet believed or who have rejected. You were just as sinful as they were. So Paul is not isolating a select group of people and saying they're wicked, but you're not wicked. Right? So we are, we are by nature children of wrath, meaning children of Satan. Now, to, a way to respond to God, not knowing the free will decisions of man. In John 3, 21, 21, it says, But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. All right? The verse says, But he who does the truth comes to the light. People who advocate for complete free will, you then have to then take this passage and say, He who does the truth comes to the light, that has to be interpreted, that you make the first move and then the Holy Spirit come behind you. Right? Because if you does the truth, that reflects doing the will of God. Right? But when you look at when you look at John 6:40, it says that this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Right? It starts off by saying, He who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. So you have to first see the Son. You have to first see the person of Jesus. Before you can believe in him. God is therefore the initiator of this work by first freeing man's will. Because the only alternative is you have to say that you have a good nature. The scripture is lying when it says that we are, we are by nature children of wrath. But we have a good nature somehow. And then the Holy Spirit comes beside us because we have a good nature. That's the only alternative to interpreting John 3.21. But the proper way to interpret it is that, is that the Son has to be revealed to us first, the gospel has to be first preached, our, free, our will is free, our will that was in bondage is now free, and now we have the capacity to respond because the Holy Spirit is working in us. Right? See, then John, John 12, 36, while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. So he starts off by saying, while you have the light, that speaks of the person of Jesus. The context of this chapter speaks of the crucifixion to come. Because when you see in the above passage in John 12, Jesus is telling them that he's about to die. He's about to be crucified. Right? So this is speaking of the gospel. Because the gospel is Christ and him crucified. To believe in the light. That you may become sons of light. So when you see the light, when you see the light and you behold his glory... That frees your will, the Holy Spirit operates in you to go to the light. Then when you go to the light, you become sons of light. 
Christ and him crucified preached is what freed man's will, enabling him to respond. And this belief is narrated on account of the revelation of Christ's redemptive work and bringing those whom he elected to salvation. I think we, I think we, have, we have put enough evidence to support that man's will is in bondage prior to hearing the gospel, that none of us can, can choose Christ, that we choose Christ because we are chosen by him. All right, this goes into the view of unconditional election. You've got conditional election that says your salvation is determined whether you say yes or no. But then there's the unconditional election view that says you are you said yes because you were chosen by him, and you said no because you were not chosen by him. All right? So it's a, it's a doctrine that God saved those who he predestined, meaning he determined for you to be saved before the foundation of the world. Now, there's some people who take this passage and then, and then say that those who reject, they must have therefore been predestined to rejection. This is called double predestination. This is the view, this is the view that was condemned in, in, in early stages of being brought forth in the church. Those who reject, they reject, being rejected, they are rejected because they were passed over. So what is the biblical support for this view of for this view of predestination and election? Well, we start with Romans 9:6. Romans 9, the passage that, that people who are free will advocates, they avoid Romans 9. Because Romans 9 supports a Calvinistic view of election, of predestination. All right, Romans 9, 6, it says, but it, is n- but it is not that the word of God is taking no effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. So the context of this passage, this is talking about Israel. So Paul had a conundrum. He's like, if the promise was given to Israel, why were there some Jews that were rejecting why did not all the Jews accept Jesus as the Messiah? Right? So he concluded by saying, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Because he, why? Because it's the word of God. He said, it is, not the, it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. The word of God will always come to pass. So if God said Israel will be saved, if there are some in Israel that reject, it's not that God's a liar. But it said not all were Israel or Israel. Right? Israel speaks of the elect. There is a physical Israel, and then there's a spiritual Israel. The physical Israel is talking about those that are born genetically Jews. They are physically Jews. But spiritual Israel is talking about those who come to faith in Jesus Christ. And said so not all of Israel, not Israel, so speaking, those that, that rejected Christ. They were the ones who were passed over. They were not the ones that were elected. The ones that had faith in Jesus Christ, those were the ones who were elected before the foundations of the world. We then go to Romans 9, 7 through 9, where it says, Nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as a seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So then so that so then he's going on to you say to say that there's there's two types of Jews. There's the Jews that are the children of the flesh. Meaning they're natural Jews, they're natural born Jews. They're genetically Jewish. They're genetically Israel. But they are cut off from God. They're not children of God. There are some that are born Jews that are chosen by God. And there are some that are passed over. There were some that were passed over, right? And then, and then he closes in verse 9, where he said, At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. The appointed son was not talking about Isaac. Isaac was just a picture of the, appoint, of the appointed son to come. The appointed son speaks of Christ, and the elector chosen in Christ through his work on the cross. Right? Then we see in Romans 9, 10 through 11, and it says, not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It says, not yet being born, speaking of his foreknowledge. But then it says, nor having done any good or evil. This speaks of his foreordination. Because what is every good work? If man is totally depraved, like the scripture said, if, if the heart of man is totally polluted, then the only way we can do anything good in the sight of God is through his Holy Spirit. So if we can only do it through his Holy Spirit, it's not on the basis of foreknowledge that we do anything good, but it's on the basis of his foreordination. 
what does this mean? This means for is foreknown because it was foreordained. Right? And it said, and it said that the purpose of God, according to what? According to election, might stand. What that means is that speaks of redemption through Christ according to whom he chose. So the merit, the merit of the merit of choosing, the merit of choosing Isaac and his children being Jacob and Esau, the merit for Jacob being chosen instead of Esau was so that the purpose of God, the purpose of God being election, according to election, might stand. So that his promise may come to pass, his promise of redemption through his son and through whom he chose to be in his son. You see further support in that in Romans 9, 12 through 13. As they said, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau, I have hated. Right? People still may take this and be like, God foreknew. God foreknew Esau would sell his birthright, therefore giving Jacob the birthright. Right? So the birthright was the older. The older, they were given the birthright. They were given the inheritance. The younger was to serve the older. But when you look at but when you look at the culture of this time period, first in the e ancient Near East, the older was the head, right? This posits God as the ordainer of, es of, of Esau's service. Because scripture says the older will serve the younger. Esau was the older. Jacob was the younger. Jacob was supposed to serve Esau. Esau ended up serving Jacob. And it does not say it does not say that. That, that, they elect, that the election of Jacob serving, because the context of this is, before they were even born, before they were even born, when they were in the womb, God said, the younger will serve, the, the older will serve the younger. Right? So this isn't on the merit of Esau selling his birthright, but it's on the merit of the purpose of God unto election. So God selected Jacob in the womb to be the one to when the promise would come forth. So it's not based on with any merit of our own. Right, but then it said Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. If we inter if we interpret this the way the way that, that we understand love and hatred, this would make God seem like a very evil person. But love and hate has a different meaning in the Hebrew. So loved means accepted. Hated means rejected. So this isn't talking about animosity, this isn't talking about an emotion. So it's not God, it's not like God has an internal hatred. For evil, this just speaks of election. So accepted means that you are, you are counted as a child of God through acceptance of Jesus Christ and, and what he did on that cross for you. Rejected means that you are not considered a child. You are not considered a child of God. You are left in your sins, right? Jacob, therefore, was elected through love. Esau was passed over through hate. Again, this isn't an emotional thing. This isn't an animosity. This isn't God playing favoritism based off of good behavior. This is reflected in God's mercy. The call, the, the call of Jacob, the call of Jacob and the passing over of Esau, it's not on any, it's not on anything that they did, because it says that it's not they did, they did this before, they did any good or evil. So on the basis of God's more mercy. Because the reality of this, we're all totally depraved, we're all totally corrupt, and we're all totally polluted. Then we all deserve the same sentence of death. Since we all deserve the same sentence of death, if God chooses some but passes over some, the fault isn't on God. Because it is us by the exercise of our free choice that we freely sin. God doesn't make us sin. We freely choose to sin. God is at perfect liberty. To choose, whom he to choose whom he desires reflected in his mercy. He doesn't choose it based off of any of the good that you and I do. Because every good work that we do is like filthy rag before a holy God. Right? Jacob was the one who was highlighted. Why? Because Israel came through him. Right? So, then we, so then we see that there's some who are chosen, there's some that are passed over. So how do we respond? How do we respond to that? Well, well, first, those who passed over, they're called the reprobate, which means rejected. Not that, not that they, not that God hates them again, not that God had animosity, but in the same way that He viewed Esau, that He didn't have an animosity towards him, but Esau was not counted as the children of God. He was left in his sins to continue, to continue in his free exercise of sin, right? So, how do we respond to the reprobate? Before we can respond to the reprobate, we have to understand the doctrine of reprobation. Starting in Romans 1.18, where it says, For the wrath of God 
is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Right? Saying the wrath of God is revealed. So then this goes into the subject, why did God choose some and why did he pass over some? The reason why he passed over some is to demonstrate his wrath, to demonstrate his judgment on sin. He cannot judge sin unless there are some who are still left in their sin. Not that God caused them to sin, not that God, not that God made them sin, not that God made them sinful. Adam's choice was a free choice and a carried consequence and the consequence of a passing on a sin nature and therefore passing on death, right? So to begin this, the context of Romans 1 is the power of the gospel through its preaching. It is judgment on those who don't believe because those who reject it, they, they, are, they, are, they have heaped up for themselves coals in the day of judgment. They have heaped up for themselves wrath. They have reserved for themselves wrath on the day of judgment because they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They see the truth, they pervert the truth, and then they suppress it. Right? We then go on to Romans 1, 19 through 22, where it says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shewn it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are, with, they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but become vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Paul is getting this from Psalm 14.1, where it says, the fool has said in their heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. And Psalm 19.1, which says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. All know that there is a God. All have sufficient evidence for God. They may call it different names, but every single person believes there are God. There's a God. They either believe in the God of the Bible, they believe in a Hindu God, they believe in themselves, or they believe in evolution. Either way, natural like and everybody believes there's a creator. They just call it different names. That's why it says what need be known of God is manifest in them. For the invisible things of him from the great of the world are clearly seen. We have evidence to a creator, we just call it different things. Right? They said they even know his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So on the day of judgment, when people have rejected, they can't say, I didn't know. You didn't give me sufficient reason. There's a lot of atheists that said, I'll believe in God if he shows himself right now. You know there's a God. You know there's a God. You just refuse him. Because even if he showed up right in front of you, you still wouldn't believe. Why? Because you're wicked. When you are wicked, you are at enmity with God. Every one of us is at enmity of God. That's even evident in our own Christian walk. Because in our Christian walk, we wrestle against our sinful desires. We wrestle against our flesh. We have a competition between our flesh and the things of God. And that's evidence in that not, in none of us perfectly obey the law of God. Why don't we perfectly obey the law of God when we still have a sinful nature that desires to go against the law of God? It is evident in our hearts. And then it says that we can vain in their imagination, meaning they, we create our own gods. We take God, we take God of the Bible, we suppress it. And then we change him to be whoever we want it to be. Right? So what is he saying? He's saying he's talking about what the, the wise, right? Who is the wise of the world? The wise of the world in Paul's time was Greek, was Greek philosophers. Today we call them atheists, we call them scientists. A lot of things we call, call them. People who think they have the world figured out, but at the same token also say, we don't know. We don't know. But then when we say we don't know, that's not sufficient. We're not reasonable, but they're reasonable. Both of us don't know. Both of us don't know with absolute, but we have an absolute, and that absolute is Jesus rose from the grave. If you want to say, if you want to say that our faith is in vain and our faith is folly and we are ignorant of truth, get through the resurrection, and then I will no longer be Christian. But the the problem is there's sufficient evidence for Jesus rising from the grave. Two thousand years there still hasn't been a body found. And that's how I know that my faith is grounded. Is grounded in reason because Christ rose from the grave. Right? Then go on to Romans 1 23 to 25, and it says, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God to an image made like the corruptible man into birds and four footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own body between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who blessed forever and ever. Amen. If we don't believe there's a God, if there are atheists that don't believe in a God, then why do we make idols? 
Why do we make our job an idol? Why do we make literal idols? Why do we find something else to worship that is greater than us? If we don't believe there's a God, every single person in the world, whether believer or not, knows there's a God. And that is evidenced by us manufacturing our own gods. Paul here, he was grounding his argument out of Genesis. You see in Genesis 4.26 that it says, And you said, and to Seth, in him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. There's a lot, there's a lot of commentators and scholars that they take this to mean this is the first time that, that they started calling out the name of God, because a plain reading of that shows that. The problem is when you look at the Hebrew, it says the Hebrew, the Hebrew for began is halal, meaning to defile or to profane, speaking of idol worship. So also Paul here. Is, is seeing that one generation after Seth, so there was Adam, then, then after Adam, Cain and Abel. First generation, man was sinful. Cain slew, slew Abel. It was just one generation, but the effects of sin to cause separation from God. Because Cain, he couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't fulfill the righteous requirements of God. He was incapable of doing such. He rebelled against God. One generation after Adam, there was rebellion. Then you see, then you see Seth. Seth was Adam's other son after Abel died. Seth was righteous. One generation after Seth, his son starts making idols. How quickly, how quickly we separate from God is because it's in our natural inclination. There's no need for a long gap, for a long gap before we rebel against God. Oh, it's just one generation. One generation, next generation, they were sinful. How often do we even see that in our own world? Because you have one generation that seems to have it all together. They make a functional society. They have things in order. Then they have children, and that, and that generation's wrecked. We think about how our own country used to be. Back in the 50s, there was a strong emphasis on morality. Then you look at the 70s, that's where you start, that, that's when you start to see, that's when you start to see more fornication, more babies out of wedlock, and all it's done is got progressively worse and worse and worse. It doesn't take long. It doesn't take long to abandon morality. Why? Because we are naturally sinful people. And we need Jesus. We need Jesus to heal us of this incurable state. Right? And then watch the say it defiles our own bodies. Because, because God says, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies. Well, why is he giving a judgment to dishonor their own bodies? Because they're already dishonored. And when you make an idol out of anything other than... Uh, if, when you make an idol and manufacture your own God instead of worship the Creator, you are dishonoring your own body because we're created in the image of God. So when you assign anything else to the God, you're saying we're created after that. When you make your job an idol, you're saying we're created out, out of that job. The same job you hate, but you say, I need to make this money, so I'm worked so I'm putting in all these hours... Even though I hate this job because the money that I make, the same job you hate, you're saying you're created in that image. So you said you're created in the same thing that you hate. When you make idols, you say when you make an idol of wood, an idol of stone, or whatever idol you make, that's what you're saying you're created after. And that is why we ought to worship the creator of God. Because he is the one whom we are modeled after. We are modeled after his image and after his likeness. We are representatives of God on this earth, not as little gods as some propose. That is heresy and that is counter to, that is counter the truth. But we are after the image of God and after his likeness. We are representatives of God on this earth and we are after his likeness. We were created to be moral creatures, but sin has so corrupted us that we have lost a sense of true morality. We only have morality on a human standard, but everything we do good is is wicked before a holy God. And then it even goes farther. Our sin has even gone farther to affect, to affect the nature of ourselves, as it says in Romans 1, 26 or 28. For this cause, God gave them up on vile affection for even their women to change natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. 
This is talking about homosexuality. So why is God, why is God going here? He's saying since they disregard the image of God, they're given over to all the vices of the flesh. Right? Since they've rejected God, they've rejected everything that God ordained. So they're given over to all the devices of the flesh. Not some, not a few, all the devices of the flesh. Right? And that's why it's saying they're going against nature. What does that mean? Nature doesn't mean the animal kingdom. That's how a lot of people interpret this. The animal kingdom is corrupted because of Adam's sin, so it can't be against nature in the animal kingdom. Nature is talking about the natural use. And speaking of that which was by design in creation. So Paul, when he's explaining the reprobate, he's going to the core of creation. He's going to the first things of creation. And what was the first thing that followed the creation of Adam and Eve? Marriage. Marriage between one man and one woman. That was the first gift that God gave men. Right? The design for man was marriage. Why? Because it typifies Christ's relationship with the church and is a foreshadow to our redemption. So the reprobate is initially personified by homosexuality because it perverts the first gift God gave man being marriage. Right? Paul, Paul uses homosexuality only as an example at the beginning of the departure from the righteous standard of the Creator. There's a lot of people hold the doctrine of reprobation, and then they take it and they adopt a hateful, for a hateful form and understanding of homosexuality, and they, they say the reprobate is only homosexual, or homosexuality is somehow a greater sin than any other sins. I don't hold to that hateful view, and quite frankly, I say that's hate speech. To isolate one sin and to place it above all other sins? That diminishes the that diminishes the whole totality of Scripture because all sin, all sin is counted the same before a holy God. All sin causes us worthy for death. Major sins, minor sins, they're all the same in the eyes of God. We all deserve death, but Christ took He took our place on that cross. So all who believe and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they will be saved from His wrath. Right. And we see evidence of this that, that it's not just homosexuals that are lumped in as reprobates. Because Romans 1, 29 32 says being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despite both proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient of parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That's a lot, that's a lot of sins that is listed on there. And when you go through that, you can find one thing that you did in your pre-converted life, and the unfortunate reality is there's something that you still do in your converted life. Right? So reprobation is not isolated in one sin. Reprobation is based off of being filled. You know, start. Verse 29 says, being filled with all of these sins. That's what separates the reprobate from the elect. The elect may still sin, but they're not filled with all these things. The reprobate are those who are filled with all these things. So what does it mean to be filled? Being filled in Greek is plural, which means to complete. So you are completely filled. You are complete with sin. The core of your being is in rejection to God. The reprobate has no sense of godliness and no inclination to truth. They make their own truth. Right? Why, why does it say that? Because they are knowing the judgment of God. So they know the judgment of God. They know his justice. They know that they're deserving of death, but they don't care. They know the penalty of sin, but toss it aside as a common thing. They treat, they treat reality as if there is no God. And what that means is it doesn't mean that they, oh, I don't think there's a creator. No, they think there's no judgment. They think there'll be no judgment. And the day of judgment, they'll pass the test. Because all that matters, all that really matters is you being a good person. The problem is none of us are good. Unless we're perfect, none of us are good. That's a hard truth to face. And then, and then when you, then people who do embrace this, that oh, the reprobate are filled with all these things. Then they take, then they take a view to where, to where they, they cast judgment on them. Like, oh, that person can't be saved. Because look at all this stuff they do, right? Paul had something for people like that because he expected people's response. And the Jews were like that with the Gentiles. The Jews, they said the Gentiles, they can't be saved. Look how wicked they are. They don't have the law of God. We have the law of God. That's why we can be saved. They can't. So Paul had a response for them in Romans 2, 1 through 4. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O men, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. 
But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things, and doeth the same, and thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, the forbearance of long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee leadeth to eat your repentance? So it starts off by saying, Thou therefore thou art inexcusable, old man. Why? Because in the same manner you judge as you condemn yourself. Because some of these things you still do. And if you still don't do them, you did do them. You did do them, and God still saved you nonetheless. Right? So we, so first off, we are not to cast judgment in the sense of in the sense of people can't be saved because of their sins. Because they're reprobate. They can't be saved. We can call sin for what it is. We can say we can we can call we can call the penalty of sin for what it is, but we can't say that they can't be saved in light of that sin, because it says in verse four, despise that thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. Why? Not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance. You came to repentance because of the kindness of God. And what is the kindness of God? When you were deserving of death, Jesus took your place. He took your death on your behalf. He took the wrath of God on your behalf so you can escape the day of judgment. Secondly, it is not our job to determine who the reprobate are. It's our job to call sin for what it is and hope that they come to repentance. But if we're going to point out sin, we have to point out the Redeemer. If we just point out sin, then we're no different than the Pharisees. But we are to be like Christ. We, we point out the problem and then point them to the solution, and the solution is the Redeemer. The judgment of God reveals the mercy of God in providing a Savior for us. And we are therefore to spread that message of hope that Christ died for our sins, that we can escape his wrath. So I'm going to close in prayer. Father God, I thank you, Father, for this word that you have given me, Father. I thank you, O God, that you have helped me in bringing forth your instruction and bringing forth the gospel. Father, I pray, Father, for all those who are here and all those who are watching, O God, that they may grow in knowledge and understanding of your son, Jesus, and that they may be filled with a heart of love, O God, that they may go forth and proclaim the gospel to every creature, O God. And I pray grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied over their lives in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.